Okay, so um, hello everyone and welcome to this Smart Cities event co-hosted by Urbis and Minter Ellison. My name is Richard Barry and I'm a senior consultant in the Smart Cities and Environmental Planning team at Urbis. Before we begin today's event, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we will virtually meet from today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. We have an exciting discussion lined up for you today, bringing together expertise from across the smart cities world to step beyond the theory and discuss the topic of implementing smart cities and how we can collectively mobilize the public and private sector to accelerate the creation of smarter, more sustainable and resilient cities. As COVID continues to impact on our daily lives and the way we interact with cities and places, a fresh light is being shone on the need to harness data-driven solutions and technology that can help create great places for people, be more sustainable and contribute to our city's economic recovery. To kick today's event off, I would like to introduce Rebecca Grasso. Rebecca is the Director of City Growth for Campbelltown City Council with responsibility for growing the city's economy, sustainability, resilience, cultural identity and reputation, as well as the organization's capability to ensure the city's successful future. With over 25 years in local government, Rebecca has led a range of significant city shaping projects and strategic planning activities. She is currently the custodian of implementing initiatives such as the Reimagining Campbelltown City Centre Master Plan and the Campbelltown MacArthur Place Strategy, Campbelltown's Economic Development Strategy, Council's Property Portfolio Strategy and the City's Sustainability and Resilience Framework. Rebecca is committed to prompting evidence-based decision-making and deep citizen engagement as key principles to achieve resilient communities and places where people want to be. Following Rebecca's presentation, I'll be passing to John Mills, an Associate Director in the Urbis Smart Cities team to moderate the panel discussion and introduce our other panel members. Rebecca, over to you. Thanks very much, Richard. I thought I'd start the conversation today with the idea of what success looks like in terms of place. And it's quite simple, really. A great place is a place where people want to be. And key is understanding what people want, how their needs and desires change over time and how we adapt places to meet this. The adaptation may be to the physical environment or to the activity within the place, which both form the human experience or to the positioning or promotion of a place, which is more about human perception. So data's all around us, and the challenge is identifying what's important to support our decision-making, our interpretation of this data and translation into action to create a great place. So what does this mean for local government? One of our key challenges is getting the balance right. We wanna focus on smart solutions to our most challenging problems. And we want to be able to identify the right innovative opportunities at the right time and not be seduced by the glitter of technology. My particular focus at this stage of Campbelltown's journey is how do we ourselves and how do we build acceptance that data and the insights that it gives us are critical for realising a resilient future? And then how do we use tech to drive great outcomes? So how are we approaching this in Campbelltown? Today I'll talk through what we're doing to build our fundamental capabilities. The first capability is evidence-based planning. So I'm really proud to talk about our reimagining Campbelltown City Centre Master Plan, which we developed side by side with Urbis. And last week we were the inaugural award recipient for place-based collaboration in the Greater Sydney Planning Awards. And just two weeks ago, we received a commendation in, in the Australian Urban Design Awards in the major planning project category. Mm -hmm. And in both um, awards, the judges highlighted Reimagining's innovative approach to evidence-based master planning. Reimagine is a thoroughly data-driven strategy with integrated monitoring and evaluation, with a front end of decisions based on evidence and a back end of monitoring and reporting informing its ongoing evolution. We refer to reimagining as a living document which seeks to explain its ongoing review and interpretation in light of new data and insights. And it means that it's a strategy that isn't going to date in a hurry. Capability two 
is about appreciating community engagement as part of our evidence base and building engagement, investing citizens in decision making. Reimagining was built with a deep community and stakeholder engagement plan, and that's really consistent with the application of this capability. There's lots of data out there, um, and engagement is a way to get what matters for our for our place, what matters for our community, and for the community to know that they're um, meaningfully invested. We're committed to delivering um, inclusive and accessible digital channels for citizens to actively engage with us, and we adopt a leave nobody behind approach to digital literacy. But even deeper, we're committed to moving along the spectrum as far as possible towards deliberative decision making. A couple of years ago, I'd convinced my CEO at the time that we do a citizen's jury for a highly political piece of work. And he was really concerned about the jury making a poor decision. The very wise person who was facilitating for me said, Rebecca, people are inherently sensible. You just have to give them access to the right information and accountability for the decision. And she was absolutely right. So we're working on building our internal understanding of the value of engagement and providing the framework for shared accountability across council and also with our citizens. Reimagining is a perfect example of how we've linked those first two capabilities. The vision and the six growth pillars of the master plan are foundational strategic directions for future decision making. This place framework reflects the values and the feedback of the community and focuses our attention on what matters for Campbelltown. These are our problem opportunity statements validated by the community to know what success looks like moving forward. We acknowledge that we can't measure everything, so we've committed to measuring one indicator within each of the commitments that we've made on the dashboard that we're currently developing. The dashboard ties in with the commitment of our third um, capability, which is accountability. So we need to measure and communicate our impact on the city and hold ourselves accountable for the delivery of the vision that we've committed to. The dashboard is a way to monitor growth and change in the city and an understanding of how initiatives in the master planning are progressing. Tools like the dashboard play an important role in building trust through transparency. And importantly, it also provides a, a support for storytelling with evidence. So telling a story that connects people to information, that's really the art of interpretation. This is key to getting community buy-in to deliver change. Our task is to tie the pieces together so that um, people can see how what we're doing now will result in achieving our shared vision. So then how does the Reimagining Campbelltown Master Plan articulate? When it comes to the principles and actions that relate to Smart City, we take some pretty decisive positions. Pillar one within the plan um, talks to being confident and self-driven. It's an overarching value which guides our approach and it contains four commitments. I'll just talk through them very quickly. Commitment one, we will identify and pursue opportunities to deliver our strategic objectives and we are unconstrained by business as usual approaches. Two, we'll use data to place people at the heart of council's decision making. We've committed to data as an asset, and this means that we'll implement a data governance framework and tools that allow data to be successfully shared in a controlled, secure and timely way that preserves privacy and security, which we know are general concerns of the community and of the private sector. Collaborating for change, number three. We know that we can't do this alone. We've identified the change that we want to see and we're committed to working with partners to deliver on our promises and aspirations. And a part of this is a commitment to evidence-driven advocacy to support both private and public sector investment decisions. And number four is really about resilience. And we all know why that's important. And that's why a lot of our tech related smart city pilot projects are focused on this resilience piece. I'll just give you a quick example. The breathing wall greets people as they arrive at Campbell by train or bus. It's beautiful and engaging, but it's more than that. It's engineered to, positive, to positively influence air temperature and quality, and it's embedded with sensors that monitor environmental changes. We're in early stages with UTS to make that data live and available. Importantly though, the wall itself tells a story about Campbelltown's aspirations and people connect with it. 
So back to our capabilities, the fourth of which is structured governance. We're focused strongly on developing truly integrated planning and reporting, not just about ticking a statutory box, but building alignment in decision making and being accountable for our commitments and transparent in our communication. We've developed a new project management framework to support our decision making and ensure we're investing in the right actions at the right time with the right effort. Council reports are a funny thing. We all know that politicians, like all humans, make emotional decisions. And we found that we'd fallen into a pattern of writing reports that influence a decision rather than providing relevant information to encourage critical thinking with sound evidence-based recommendations. And that's not to say that the recommendations and decisions were wrong, but what we weren't doing was providing a transparent view of how and why particular decisions were being made. So we've changed the way that we present reports and the ultimate outcome that we seek to um, achieve out of this is, is trust. Capability five is around value and collaboration. So our participation in the Western Sydney City deal is the opportunity of a lifetime, three tiers of government and eight councils taking a place-based approach. There's a long list of projects that the partnership's working on. And on the smart city side, those that Campbelltown has invested in include the development of a digital action plan for the Western City itself, a shared data visualisation and IoT data storage solution, a drone pilot which identifies improvements to asset management assessment, an augmented reality pilot that seeks to improve the design of buildings and the community engagement experience through the DA and consultation or construction process, and then also um, the city deal data sharing policy. We've also challenged the community, local businesses, schools and the university sector to undertake research with us and to develop new products and services that solve city issues. We have a partnership with the Western Sydney University to better understand urban heat. And together we installed a temporary sensor network to monitor microclimatic variations across the local government area. And we're now working to apply our learnings for better place outcomes along with the other test um, local government areas of um, Cumberland and Parramatta. Capability six is a bit of a loop. It's about developing the tools and culture that build the capability of council. And as we move forward, we're realising that we need people with new skills to tackle these problems and make the most of the opportunities presented by smart cities. So we're actively changing the working models within council and building new capability in areas that build capacity. We're investing in a new research and insights capability and we've just recruited some super smart people into that area. I'm very excited about that. Um, building the concept of business excellence and also a culture of critical thinking. So the discipline process of gathering and interpreting appropriate information to understand a problem or opportunity and then the considered analysis of options before reaching a conclusion. Capability seven is about innovation. We're focused on promoting and developing ideas, the culture being brave and bold, but not reckless, and then supporting this with tools and systems for decision making. So we've implemented a system of project proposals as part of our project management framework. And that means that anyone in council can submit an early idea that can be developed into a project passing through a gateway process. And also the idea of options appraisals. So we're embedding the practice of the systematic assessment and evaluation of all possible alternative approaches before we jump to a solution. And that's quite a novel idea, isn't it? Um, and a key, this is all key to critical thinking and defendable um, positions, decisions. If we get this right, we're very clear with what success looks like for Campbelltown and we're confident that our priorities reflect those of the community but we'll be constantly engaging with them because we know that things change. I just wanted to round out the link back to where I started. And that is that it's all about understanding what people want, how their needs and desires change over time, and then how we adapt um, places to meet, uh, places to meet, and that's critical. The data's all around us, the challenge is identifying what's important to support our decision-making, our interpretation of the data and translation into action to create a great place. We know in local government that we have some fundamental challenges to overcome, and that's been the basis of us getting our house in order. So what does it look like if we get right, get, get all of it right? Our communities and stakeholders will trust us. 
Our communities, business and industries are resilient and thrive no matter what. We make efficient use of our precious resources and well-informed decisions about the environment that we're custodians of. And ultimately, we're a place where people want to be. So I hope that was, um, that was useful and interesting and I'm looking forward to um, digging into some of these topics a little deeper in the panel discussion shortly. Thanks, Richard, over to you. Oh, John, sorry, over to John. <laughs> no, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> that was a really good, um, really good speech and congratulations again on your um, recent awards. I think it's really good to see um, for these sort of things, the, what's key, like you said, there's create a great foundation, make decisions based on evidence and then keep following that through because you've got a commitment to spend public funds wisely and people want to make sure they can follow that up as well. So the monitoring that's key. And I think it's really great to see um, this rightly recognised and awarded. So well done again. Thank you. Um, so as Richard said, my name is John Mills. I'm the Associate Director here at Urbis. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce the panel for today's discussion. So joining Rebecca on the panel, we've lined up a group of um, industry experts, all with a wide range of knowledge and skills relating to implementation of smart cities. So firstly, we have Theresa Pang from Minter Ellison. Theresa is an infrastructure, property and telco specialist with over 16 years experience. She's part of Minter Ellison's Future Cities team, where she helps enable clients to unlock all opportunities in respect of what makes a smart, safe and sustainable city. Prior to rejoining Minter Ellison, Theresa spent over nine years in-house at Australia's largest independent wireless infrastructure owner, where she worked across the infrastructure property asset lifecycle. Next, we have Simon Hunter, who's the Executive Director of Smart Places Evidence and Insights at the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. This group is leading the development of the Smart Places program, which is to embed smart cities into the planning of urban and regional areas, including Western Sydney. Simon spent more than 15 years working in New South Wales government and consulting to uh, government and industry. And next, we also have uh, Mavan Jayatalinka, who's the founder of One Wi-Fi. One Wi-Fi are a smart city and active Wi-Fi 4G and 5G neutral host services company. Mavan spent most of his career in management consulting in the TMT sector. He applies his strong conceptual thinking to advise clients on how to profit from the rapidly converging sectors of telecommunication and media through smart city solutions. And finally, we have Urbis' own uh, Madonna Locke. Uh, Madonna's an urban design director here at Urbis. She brings qualifications in architecture and urban design and has 20 years experience working in Australia and internationally. Most importantly, she's the lead Urbis director on the Reimagining Campbelltown City Centre Master Plan. She's passionate about tailoring people-centric, evidence-based urban design outcomes for cities and communities. So I'd like to uh, jump into it. Before I do, just to let you know, if you've got any questions, please put them through. We'll have some time for questions at the end. So put, put your questions through and I'm sure our panel will be happy to try and do their best to answer. Um, and note that we're also going to have uh, opportunities. Uh, this recording will be available to everyone who's registered. So there will be contact details. So happy to carry on the discussion with any more questions after this event. So to jump right in everyone, um, the focus of today is deep diving into implementing smart cities and places. Um, so following on from Rebecca's keynote speech, um, I wanted to start on some of the challenges from the different perspectives. And I think as Rebecca talks about there, we have to obviously work out an evidence base, you know, we have to work out what data are we using um, and how does that incorporate into benefits of people, you know, not putting technology for technology's sake. But at that stage, um, and I'd like to go to you, Mavon, actually, because from your perspective, you've worked across the whole country um, for different um, councils and private um, landowners as well, um, implementing smart cities technology. So I suppose twofold to you is, what do you see are challenges that slowing some of the implementation of smart cities from your point of view, or maybe not slowing, but some challenges you come across. And some of the, I'd like you to expand upon some of the challenges around implementing smart cities early into a new project. So obviously some of these placemaking projects where we can incorporate early or retrofitting, obviously the impacts that house upon our built environment, the visual and the like, which is, which is obviously something that I'm sure you come across a lot. So Mavon, have you got any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, look, I think the, the, the challenge is uh, before you start any sort of smart city project is to have a clear objective of what it is that you want to achieve um, and communicate that effectively within the stakeholders. But from a practical implementation perspective, it really you really need to have a, a strategic framework or a blueprint that you're working towards before you start implementing. Um, and that needs to be very well articulated so that uh, and and all the different stakeholders to be included in that uh, in on that journey um, normally um, you know engaging engaging with those stakeholders are is really key um, so you end up with the shared vision that you want to achieve um, in getting your smart city provider also involved uh, early in the Piece is really important um, because uh, so normally that should happen during you know when you're implementing uh, greenfield kind of uh, deployments it really needs to be during earthworks just so that you can get the, the foundations better down before you start uh, looking at uh, deploying uh, solutions and technologies because if you don't have that right it can be very costly to um, make it fit for purpose subsequently. So there really are uh, important aspects of, um, of any implementation is that the front end piece to get that foundation right. Well, I, I suppose my question, and Theresa, you've mentioned this last week as well, what's if you can't get in at the front end? I mean, we're looking at sometimes projects have long life cycles, and Theresa, you talked about one last week. We talked yeah. about five year life cycle. My, my thought turned to that as well, that's the evolution from 4G to 5G. So, I mean, we're obviously on this, this, this pathway now, and how do we, I suppose, how do we think about retrofitting for the future? How can we take account of that? I mean, what we need to do to protect ourselves? Yeah, so just, just as the technology and the business case are constantly evolving in assessing the viability of smart technology, we found as lawyers that the legal contracts need to evolve as well. So a few weeks ago, I was actually lucky enough to catch up with the lovely Kate Charlton. Kate is the development manager for AMP Capital's amazing new key quarter tower development down in Circular Key. That amazing development is due for practical completion in 2021. So that's just around the, around the corner. That's super exciting. Um, it's an amazing new lifestyle high-tech precinct development which will span two city blocks. Kate was actually kind enough to take me on a tour of this massive new development. On the tour, Kate pointed out where the new commercial offices would be, where the new funky wine bars would be. There's also going to be 104 new residential apartments. Um, and when she mentioned the apartments, I actually asked her to send me a link because I wanted to have a sticky beak on how they look like. Kate actually said, oh, don't worry, TP. Um, they sold out in two hours off the plan back in 2016. And she also mentioned that the main agreement for lease for the, for the development, for the commercial offices, was signed back in 2016 as well. So here we actually have a five-year time lag from entering into the legal contracts to practical completion of this amazing new high-tech precinct development. And so from a legal contracts perspective, as lawyers, we're seeing a much broader definition of permitted use being pushed for by the technology providers. Um, this obviously helps the technology providers ensure software updates can easily be pushed through the products. And if there is a need to upgrade or swap out the hardware or equipment, there's no need to renegotiate a new legal contract. We're finding that the definition of licensed area for technology providers is evolving as well. Instead of seeking a license to simply a flat surface area for their equipment or hardware, they are now pushing for a 3D volumetric area to allow them the flexibility they need for the evolving technology changes. So the key is to really balance the requirements of both the building or infrastructure owner and also the technology provider. The building owner wants certainty as to what technology is being installed, what it looks like, where exactly it sits on the site plan, 
and then the technology provider requires enough flexibility for the evolving technology and future upgrades. And for, for landlords, it's also important to make sure your future technology plans don't impact on your tenants' rights. Um, so data and privacy rights are key considerations here as well. So yeah, it's definitely great if you can try and have discussions with your lawyer early on, on in the piece, um, just to ensure that any legal contracts um, can be future-proofed as much as possible. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I was, the thing that came to mind, I was thinking of that as well is because just from my experience, the planning process as well, um, and obviously having to embed some of this stuff within the planning process. Yeah. And I don't know if any of Mavan or Simon, you may have come, have come across any uh, planning or process um, hurdles from the planning process when coming to implementing or if there is issues that come about at that stage, trying to come in and retrofit in the middle. Well, I can quickly just add something to that. Um, so, John, yes, um, retrofitting is always uh, costly and cumbersome, um, yeah. uh, and, and, and therefore, it's, it, it, by its nature, it's disruptive. Um, so, when you're trying to do a business case for um, an implementation, um, and that business case uh, has the cost and the benefits laid out, when you go to retrofit, you always come across um, unforeseen obstacles um you know in our most recent deployment we obviously um bulk of the implementation was um in a greenfield area but we had a missing piece that we needed to join the solutions together with and that was on a heritage uh, listed site so you know that only became uh, known much later on and and that resulted in Time blowout and cost blowout because of that. So, um, and I think we are obviously uh, with good advice from you on that topic uh, earlier this year. So, yes, uh, it adds to the complexity and inevitably um, um, reduces the, the business case benefits. Thanks, Mavon. Yeah, no, I <laughs> I remember that one. That's and that's why I always think sometimes when these projects are going in. Um, you know, these, I, we all know things things crop up along along the way. You know, but it's just trying to man, manage those risks. And I think, I suppose, from my point of view, I don't think some of this has been necessarily. And you can't think of everything, but some of this hasn't always been thought of. I suppose, and that's why we need uh, policy and regulation um, around some of this. Which Simon, I was actually going to good time to throw into you. Obviously, New South Wales brought out the Smart Places strategy, which I have to commend you for, actually. It's a, it's a great strategy, but can you tell us a little bit about that and how you think it's going to overcome some of the challenges or streamline the implementation of smart cities um, across New South Wales? Yeah, uh, thanks, Richard, um, and appreciate the, the feedback on the strategy. It was a, um, a labour of love and a very much a co-developed um, piece of work because we, we got a lot of advice from industry, from the research sector and from local and state government to help us understand what was important to make smart cities work. And that strategy is really built around um, customer outcomes and, and using technology to deliver maximum benefit of place. But to get there, um, there's a bit of a journey to go through. And so we, we break down the actions in the strategy under, under three headings. The foundations, the things that you need to put in place to get it right. The enablers, the things that will help push and boost our capability. And then programs that will be specific area and initiative based things to, to deliver this. And, and starting with the foundations, that's where I think um, a lot of work still needs to happen about what are the standards that we're going to adopt that will work for every local government area that will work across each of the states and and will deliver us you know interoperable technology solutions that help us get to that point and then when you think about enablers we're talking about things like procurement reform and commissioning for outcomes mm -hmm. designing our, our procurement processes and things like that so that we can allow the the ine inevitable march of technology to be kept pace with with arrangements that we have and not keep having to go back to market for things that may be obsolete by the time we've procured them and then in terms of programs it's really applying area-based 
work and you know the partnership that we have with the eight local government areas of the western parkland city for the city deal is i think a really great flagship of how state governments and local governments can work together on this and and all of those initiatives if you like are, are what we see as the the roadmap to making the smart cities agenda ubiquitous across what state government does whether it's linear infrastructure place-based infrastructure or or service delivery so simon and i might i'll go to you rebecca after this as well on this so what are the challenges around procurement at the moment sorry mate i missed that what are the challenges around procurement at the moment um I think my colleagues from local government will give a much more eloquent answer on this than, than I will because we, we've had some joy using innovation challenges and, and flexibility and, and things like that um, at, at state level. So, so I don't face these challenges as much as what I've heard from local government, they, they face them as. Um, Rebecca, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think procurement is one of our biggest challenges. So. The city deal does offer a fantastic opportunity for us to think really innovatively and collectively across all tiers of government in how we address that. Um, you know, I think local government, because we're so close to the coalface, um, that we are, I'm not saying we're more accountable for um, the financial decisions that we make, but the community absolutely draw the line almost in a personal way um between us and the decisions that we make around procurement so we're just we just need to be really accountable we need to be making sure that we um we're making we we there's a level of trust that we're making the right decisions with the, with with the community's money so we've got to break the way that it is at the moment though because honestly it's so constrained mm -hmm. we're working through a process at the moment i know that the state government for example have an proposals um, policy that's run through Treasury. We're actually in the process of developing our own so that we can be a little bit more agile too. But it's it's legally fraught. It, you, you know, there's one thing about being at the leading edge. Leading edge, you're also um, opening yourself up to the most criticism possible as well. So anyway, I think City Deals is a great opportunity for us to collectively work through some of these challenges. And uh, just moving on to what you just talked about the community. So what, what was the sort of feedback you had from the community when you sort of embarking on this? Um, do, you, do you get in like a, I mean, I assume there's a general positivity at the outset or, or are there still people skeptical? And I mean, I've heard anecdotes of people doing, for instance, smart city strategies and people piling in about 5G to them, you know, completely missing the point. And that's one side of thing, but the other thing like you just talked about is spending, spending people's money and obviously, what benefits they're going to get out of this. Yeah, and that's why we really think about it as um, creative solutions to our most challenging problems. And it's about creating that personal link between um, people honestly just want their most immediate and basic needs met. And when it comes to planning for the future, it's quite often difficult for people to vision that future. And what we might be doing or proposing in a, in a smart city space or a future focused space is sometimes seen as a distraction. People want their needs met now. So it's, it's how do we actually make sure that, you know, it's human instinct to base your perspective on firstly on your personal experience and then to seek opinion or information to validate that position. And we know that people make emotional decisions. So we want to make sure that we develop trust through that evidence base um, for our decision making. So people don't have to wade through, you know, swathes of pages of technical engineering or financial reports to satisfy that the right or, you know, business case to, to, to be satisfied that the right decision is made. So how do we first use data to help people um, establish their initial considered position? And then how do we build trust through that um, meaningful and regular um, not just reporting, but adjustment of our approach based on that feedback, whether it be data or whether it be insights from the community. I think you make a really good point there too, Rebecca, about um, linking the, the data and the evidence to what people actually want. And I think that's one of the key things we learned through reimagining. And it's good to see it reflected in the, the document you've produced, Simon, called Smart Places and not Smart Cities, because uh, it really does link us to the intimacy and the experience that we have. And I think, you know, one of the key things I remember coming out of reimagining really strong from the community is that 
Campbelltown can be really hot, especially the city centre. And the, the work that you did on the heat monitoring brought evidence to that. At the same time, we were doing the master plan and then we were hearing that come through really strong from the community, but also, for, also from industry and people who were in the city centre. And the, the real challenge I think that we face with a lot of this is we have some really sophisticated ways of measuring some things in our cities. For example, traffic. We measure traffic a lot. We have really great um, models that we build to project what traffic is going to be like in the future as a result of things. But we're probably not as advanced on some of the other things that are becoming more important today. So urban heat, what's the benefits of trees in our city? Mm -hmm. and then Benefits. It's just not about heat. It's also about biodiversity. It's about what the places that people actually want to go and stay in often have a lot of trees. And it's a really intangible thing to measure. How do you actually measure the benefit of those trees? And not just how many trees we have, but the actual benefits themselves. Yeah. So one of the challenges I see is us really challenging ourselves to come up with new measures for our cities to measure the things that are actually going to matter into the future and to work out ways to measure that now, but also to project those benefits into the future. And that's one of the things we had to think about in, in Campbelltown was how do we measure what we have today, but how are we going to project those benefits to identify a, what is a really long-term plan um, and work out that we can have the evidence or the support base to actually endorse that plan and make a plan to implement it into the future. Um, and I think we're just, cities are really just starting that journey. Um, and I think we're starting to see that coming through. Mm. Because one of the key things with that too is how quickly can we access and understand the data to help us with quick decisions? So what information do we have? What do we need to make available and how? Because it's that lag in data availability that decreases trust and decreases that opportunity for evidence-based decision. And that's really where, you know, that idea of real-time data and dashboards are really invaluable. And then the transparent demonstration of that to the community so that they can, you know, can use that as a storytelling piece too. I think I was thinking before, but it's really important for the community to be able to see what the benefits are, you know, because at the going back to that point again you're spending their funds and the average person on the street you know could be like oh this is all well and nice but you know how does this affect me you know so i think it's really important as you were saying with donna's selecting that right data and making sure that information can go back to the community yeah. um, and, and the really short sharp initiatives are important too i yeah. think we've seen that come about through covid um transport for new south wales have been partnering with councils to deliver pop-up cycleways um, and they're starting, they're monitoring. You can see if you cycle along them that they've got monitoring on there. But we're going to need to interpret that data really, really cleverly because even the, the movement we're having in our cities now is still in a post COVID or current COVID situation. So there's still a lot of people who are not going back to work every day. They're still operating in a different way. And we don't know how long that's going to last or whether that's going to be an actual shift into the future. So comparing that data that we have with data a year ago isn't just as simple as com that comparison. We need to do more work to understand how what percentage of the population is on the move and understanding that. Um, and I think the, the um, Department of Planning's program to do streets of shared spaces and do a whole lot of pilot um, pop-ups around New South Wales, um, of which Campbelltown have been successful to do one in one of the, the really key places for their community down the Queen Street spine. I think that presents a really significant opportunity to test a lot of small interventions um, and adjust also really importantly I think Rebecca's talked about adjusting along the way um, and I think in this space with this new information we're going to have we're going to find out new things that we may not have known about previously. Um, Rebecca you might want to talk a little bit more about that opportunity. Yeah it's really it's a great opportunity for Campbelltown so what we heard loud and clear through our community engagement for reimagining is that the revitalization of Queen Street is key it's about the identity of Campbelltown, it's about the economics, and it's absolutely about the sense of place. Um, so the Streets and Shared Spaces program is going to enable us to show the community very quickly um, what we mean when we say reimagining. 
So that's been a fantastic opportunity, but but it builds in with um, all of those principles that I was talking about, you know, um, taking risk, um, being brave, testing and trialling, having an iterative process um, and having a data-driven approach to that. So we're at the moment establishing what our baseline looks like um, mm -hmm. so that we can continually measure and adapt as we go through that process. So we're deep in um, developing now what um, that looks like. So it's a series of place-based um, uh, you know, tactical urbanism interventions. So some of them are physical. It's about testing and trialling, for example, how parking works on the street or doesn't work on the street. And that enables us to have a pretty dynamic dialogue with um, local retailers. And then also things that are around activation. But coming back to um, the COVID situation, when we were originally talking about streets as shared spaces, it wasn't anticipating that we would still be in a state of you know, we can't host large scale events. We can't be drawing people into yeah, the city yeah. centre. So it's, for us, it was then a bit of a pivot to think about, we've got people who work here already, what we call the first floorers, people who work above the, the street level retail in offices and so forth. How do we actually make sure that they are better connected to the, to the street level experience? So we'll just need to adjust and pivot as we go along with that. But it's such an awesome opportunity and a really good um, program, I think, and initiative from the state government. Yeah, and I'm, look, I'm glad you guys brought up COVID because I had, that's obviously a few of the things, um, we're in a different landscape now with COVID and it's obviously changed changed a lot of things. So I suppose, if I could hear a bit from Mavan or Simon about what are you, some of the opportunities or benefits that come from COVID at the moment, some of the projects that you may have been involved with. Simon, yeah, look, um, Mervan, you go first, mate. Uh, sure, okay. Um, thanks, Simon. Um, thanks, John. Uh, so look, um, it has... Um, it has changed the focus on some of the deployments. So uh, the, one of the most recent deployments, um, you know, it was about um, improving activation in public spaces. Um, so we've, we've done a number of implementations, but the recent one was about how, do we, how does council deliver a better service um, into those public spaces through smart city enablement. So for instance, we, we now have systems where we monitor uh, the public facilities uh, in parks and we report in real time when the usage is peaking, um, when, when the soap um, runs low, um, it, uh, the, the, the relevant council department gets notified so they can go back and replenish the soap, sense, uh, soap dispensers. We count people to let the, the parks department know when there's high utilization, it may need more cleaning, more frequent cleaning, um, through to social distancing um, monitoring solutions um, where uh, people can social distance themselves and police themselves in, uh, independent of security or, or park rangers. Um, it all helps, um, all the solutions we've been doing lately have had a, that type of focus. Um, and, you know, some councils have embraced that more than others, but um, certainly uh, um, there's a, been a more um, interest in those types of solutions uh, in, in this last six to 12 months. Yes, yeah, so we've had a question pop up actually on this. You know, real-time data is critical. Thanks, Salvador, for your question. What was the output data of COVID compared to prediction? Does anyone... So Sorry, real-time data is critical. What does the output data of COVID compare to prediction? Does anyone like to uh, have an idea on it? <laughs> we have that data. Yeah, I think we've done some um, analysis of um, some of the activity some in, in some of our major cities using human movement analysis. So real-time data of um, people moving around the city. Um, and it was pretty interesting to see some of those changes. Um, some of the insights, I've seen plenty of insights across um, different reports, but some of the insights have definitely been about, for example, how the peak movement of people um, in peak travel has really spread out um, a lot. So I think that's um, something that will be interesting to see if that continues further into um, our, guess, our COVID recovery. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, the activity around parks and local centres was really increased compared to CBDs. And I think we all, we all know a lot of that. Um, I think what's probably going to be really interesting 
is that probably the next six months or the, the next 12 months until we have, um, I guess, a vaccine and um, can move around the world more freely, um, what those patterns, the more normal looks like um, and, and really interestingly seeing if that's actually going to influence a, a change in the longer term. Um, I think that, well, that, that personally for me um, is one of the things that I think is going to be really interesting because um, we still know that, you know, people coming together is something that's really important and whether that's socially or for work, um, there's a lot of benefits that come from that actual physical proximity to each other. Yeah. yeah. At, at a New South Wales government level, I, I would say that the response to COVID has been evidence-led the whole way through. Um, and there's been a really, really strong sense of collaboration from, from all of the state agencies led under the, the Data and Analytics Centre through, through a working group that brings together most of the data holders and principal analysts across the state, where we share on a twice weekly, three times weekly as needed basis, what insights are coming out. And then we, we look together to understand how, what's happening in transport, what's happening in centres activity, what's happening in health, what's happening in the justice sector. All of these things are, are changing and we're learning from each other what some of those interrelationships are. Um, New South Wales, through the creation of the Data Analytics Centre a few years ago, really established the framework for that, but COVID and and the the pandemic and the economic um, conditions we face has really been a catalyst for um, a game changing approach to sharing of information and data, and just a thirst from our decision makers for quality analytics and insights. I think that's not just a local phenomenon, right? Um, if if you think about like Strava, the running app. Um, or running and writing app there, they've created a, a data release that you can access if you're involved in urban planning as a free resource to, to get a sense of how much activity is happening in your parks with people exercising and, and things like that. And the value that that'll deliver us in terms of understanding that, that public and open space use and things I think will be really huge going forward. So, I mean, my reflection on, on the last six months is that COVID and, and in particular our state government's approach to this and the evidence-led approach has really been a game changer in sharing data, in accessing new sources and in collaborating on, on analysis of, of what some of those data feeds mean. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree there. Um, Teresa, I just wanted to get your thoughts as well, um, what you're hearing from your clients around you know the changes that have occurred over the past what we are now nine months due to this pandemic yeah well def definitely within the um the property space it's um, focused around the regeneration of the city and how potential new uses there could be for office buildings so we're hearing potentially warehousing use for the immediate delivery of, um, of goods that you purchase online um, a, a really good example of a, of a successful smart cities project, I think, um, that has become even more successful due to COVID is the Google Wind Dream project that both Minter Ellison and Urbis were fortunate enough to be involved in and support Google Wing on. So with this project, we had two Minter Ellison partners, Andrew Hood and Ben Fuller, who worked with Google Wing on this world first drone delivery initiative. So that's up and running in Canberra and also Logan City in Brisbane at the moment. Um, it's an excellent example of collaboration between the government, private sector and the community as a whole. In 2018, the Queensland government actually introduced an ambitious whole of government drone strategy, making it clear to the world that it wants to be at the forefront of global drone technology that obviously attracted national and international investment, including from Google Wing, the Queensland government engaged in highly, a highly consultative approach with the public and private sectors and also the local community. And, and it made sure that it was um, taking a people first approach and ensuring that drones were the right way to solve some of our existing day to day problems. Um, yeah, and I actually did some internet shopping last, last <laughs> week. I'm excited to show everyone. So I purchased 
an LSKD um, top and leggings from this funky new Brisbane-based activewear company. And from purchasing the goods online to arrival at my door, it took three business days. And Jessie from Google Wing is telling me that because LSKD have partnered up with Google Wing, if I had lived in Logan City, delivery to me would have only been in 10 minutes. So that, that's, that's insane. That's an immediate benefit that I can see. Um, and and trust them. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely, yeah. So you mean to say we could have looked really hip and funky in 10 minutes as opposed to waiting three business days. Um, but on, on a serious note, the wing drones can be used to deliver urgently required medicine or safety supplies and in emergency situations. They could be used to safely resupply people stranded by fires or flooding. Um, it's lightning fast delivery, which is contactless and COVID safe. Uh, due to COVID, Google Wing has actually experienced a 500% increase in deliveries as customers want to access goods in a contactless way. So I think that that's a really good example of how success looks like, um, especially in this COVID environment, and, and definitely great collaboration between public and private, um, and, and not to mention benefits to the environment as well. There's reduced CO2 emissions and reduced traffic congestion. So it's, it's definitely a very exciting space. I was going to say, it's except that COVID's obviously accelerated because who would have thought years ago that we'd get the stuff delivered by a train? I mean, it's amazing. Exactly, exactly. And coffees as well. It's really fantastic. I go cold. But um, look, in the interest of time, we're um, obviously running a little bit over time. I've got time just for uh, a question here from uh, Vincent. Um, so I don't know, I'll read it out on whoever wants to take this uh, before we wrap things up. Um, for smart city technology to work at their best, the need for systems to be able to communicate and share data increases. What will happen if businesses and cities implement different technologies to address the same issues, e.g. traffic management? Will a disjointed system be a hindrance to a smart city evolution as a whole? So I don't know who wants to take. I reckon we probably all have perspectives on this. Yeah, I think, I I think yeah, absolutely a hundred percent being able to create systems that talk to each other and that, that mandate interoperability is, is one of those huge challenges that we've got to get right. But that's not at an individual local government level. That's not um, state by state. That's a national level yeah. thing where mm -hmm. we, we all have to work together. And, and we've got to use collaborative governance forums like the City Deal. We've got to partner with organisations like Standards Australia, mm -hmm. things like that to, to do that um, and really get that framework because otherwise we're going to be paying lots and lots of money to lots of people to develop APIs that are just band-aids that, that we could avoid. Absolutely. And do you see that, do you see that coming? The, 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 stand, the standards play is definitely happening and um, and there is a, a really dynamic working group that, that Standards Australia have going on that. That's good to hear. Um, look, we've run out of time. We could go on. We could actually have a carry on all day. We've got a criminally short amount of time. So, look, I just want to thank everyone who's uh, tuned in this afternoon. It was a really fascinating discussion. Um, I'd like to carry it on with you. Obviously, so feel free to contact us afterwards. Mm -hmm carry this on um, but I'd like to hand over and thank you again for the panelists thanks for your time like really do appreciate that um, but I'd like to hand over to Teresa to formally close this afternoon's uh, event over to you Teresa. On, on behalf of everyone at Urbis and Mr Ellison a sincere thank you to all of our guests for joining us today special thank you to all of our speakers as well for sharing their insights and very important work in this smart city space for those wanting to continue the dialogue on smart cities, there are several important initiatives that Minsters and Urbis are work, working on, um, and we really encourage everyone to just reach out to us and try and get involved where possible. I know Phoebe Roberts down in our Minster Ellison Melbourne office is doing some amazing work in the sustainability space um, and also exploring post-COVID business models. At Minters and Urbis, we are out in the market all the time, supporting our clients with their smart cities initiatives. We, we love creating lasting impacts in our communities, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us, even if it's to just bounce some ideas. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone.
Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.